Um, I'm Paul Orienti. I'm going to speak today. I'm going to talk to you all about uh, networks and application of network theory to the brain. Um, a lot of people think about networks, think about like neural networks. And I'm not going to talk about traditional what you think of as neural networks. This is wor work out of a field called network science that I'm going to talk about today. This, this first image is actually a cool image I always show. It's the, it's the internet. Not the web, it's the internet, the hard computer servers and wires that Bell Labs, actually Bill Cheswick and Bell Labs are mapping. And apparently it's a real challenge because you can imagine anyone can add a computer to the internet and so it's really hard to map these out. They send out some sort of robots to detect and, and do pings, but it's pretty complex. But in general, this type of network, whether it's a computer or a brain or a social network, they have a lot of properties that are similar and a lot of things, a lot of information that once we build a network, we can extract and get a lot of information out of it. Because if you look at this, you can tell me very little. You might be able to say, oh, look, you know, maybe one of this, the, one of these big, I don't have a mouse, one of these big green things or something might be a hub. It has a lot of connections, but in general, you can't say much about it. So I'm going to talk about how we can take something like this and actually turn it into useful information. But first... I want to remind you of what you all are. <laughs> now, who is on Facebook? How about over there? I didn't see. Who all is on Facebook over there? Or who's lying and doesn't want to admit they're on Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So Facebook is a great example of a social network. And, and computers have really enabled us to take advantage of networks and explore networks. But Facebook was started by... Uh, this guy who I always blink on his name, but anyway, he's a billionaire. He's 25 years old. He was a student at Harvard when he started this. And it was first open just to select universities, and then he opened it up to the entire United States here in like 2005 and six, And then in like 2006 and seven, they opened it up to the whole world. And for some reason, you see all the terrorists hiding out down here where they're hooking up to talk to their friends from college or something. And then all the way up to here is 2009. This was, the, oops, this was last year's, this was last year's uh, map when they were hitting their milestone of 200 million members on Facebook. And just to put this in perspective, the U.S. population is like 300 million, right? And Facebook, now this is worldwide. Facebook had 200 million people in, uh, it was, I forget, March-ish, yeah, March or April of 2009. In 2000, in December of 2009, they hit 350 million members. And in the United States is 150 million. So half of the United States is on Facebook. I mean, this is huge. This is uh, sort of a new revolution of how we transmit, how we use information. And not only that, but once we have these networks, how can we extract information back out of them? How could Facebook use Facebook to target certain people and get certain information out of it. How could you advertise in the right places with 200 or 300 million people? Where, where do you put the advertisement? And I think today we'll talk some about that. Um, by the way, I checked just yesterday and uh, February 6th was their fifth birthday and they hit 400 million people. So the growth of this is tremendous if you look at it. It took them uh, about four and a half years to hit 200 million people. And then it took them about seven months to hit 350, and it took them about three months to hit 400 million. If they go at this rate, I plot it out, it's exponential growth. It, they'll be at like a billion people in 2000 and late 2011 or something. It's ridiculous. I don't know if it, it, it probably can't keep growing. I mean, there's not an infinite number of people on the earth, right? <laughs> All right. So what is a network? And what I'm talking about, I'm talking about networks. Uh, a network is simply a collection of nodes. Nodes are things, uh, people in Facebook, computers on the internet. In this picture, they happen to be species of uh, living things in a, in a reef in the Caribbean. And so each node here represents a different species from plants at the very bottom and plankton up to carnivorous fish at the very top. And basically edges are, are, are relationships, relationships between things. So in this case, the edges represent predator-prey relationships. If there's a line, one node eats the other node, okay? In Facebook, it's all your friends. In the internet, it's computers that are actually connected by hard wires. 
So a network is simply a collection of nodes and the edges that connect them, and the edges are just relationships, okay? From these, we can extract a ton of information. This, this is an example of a real useful network. Facebook has, is kind of fun and stuff, but like scientifically, we haven't been using Facebook. This is what ecologists are using to study how different species interact in a real life world. And this is all the species in that particular reef system. And now they can take this network and study what happens when global warming kills off this plant down here at the bottom. What does that do to the food chain and this network as it trickles up? Because in a network, inherently, everything is interconnected. So you can get from any one node to any other node in this network by traveling across the edges. So now, if you change one node, you effectively change the system. It's no longer the same network because that trickles through the entire network. The change could be trivial or the change could be traumatic. And, and we'll talk about what makes a change trivial and what makes a change traumatic. This is my favorite network. This is a high school sexual network from a high school in the Midwest that this guy Moody studied, 528. I guess they were high school juniors and then he followed them for 18 months. He logged all of their sexual relationships. So all the blue dots are boys, all the pink dots are females. In over 18 months, every sexual relationship he, he documented, of course, it's dependent on, on them um, telling him. And what he found was after 18 months, what's just frightening is 52% of this class was involved in one giant sexual network. So it's not surprising that if one person shows up in the school with HIV, how that disease can transmit throughout the whole, throughout the system. And so people are actually using this type of sexual network analysis to study sexually transmitted diseases. So while I find it kind of humorous, it actually has real use. So you can figure out, you know, wh who should we immunize and why? You can also usually find the, call the high school quarterback who's right there. <laughs> and, as well as some other interesting people if you look at this graph very closely. Um, and that was me in high school. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to show one more cool network, and, but I'm going to show it for a very uh, explicit reason. This is essentially the airline network of the United States. What this graph is, it's actually an artist made this, shows every flight logged with the FAA that went through U.S. airspace on August 15th, 2008. 205,000 flights were flown through the U.S. And every one of those flight paths is plotted on here. And so you look at it and you're like, well, there's not 205,000 plots of lines on there. Well, there actually is. You're just seeing it from, from far out. And if I zoom in, this is a zoom in on Chicago. So you can see just in Chicago, the number of flights going through there in this graph is in tremendously complicated. You can't look at that and really extract any useful quantitative information. So there's actually a, a scientist up at Michigan who does a lot of this work, and he calls them ridiculograms because they're ridiculous. You can't, you can't say anything about that. But um, you can if you start to quantitatively assess these. And so I'm going to spend the next probably 15 minutes talking about three metrics that we extract out of these graphs and what they can tell us and how we can use those metrics. And then the latter half of this, I'm going to go, I decided I was going to give a regular talk, but I decided the last half, I'm going to talk about what we've been doing lately where we took this information and built a functioning brain model that like does stuff. It's not doing a lot yet, but it does stuff nonetheless.